cover this. So this is an introduction as to who I am and what I do. So I could claim to be a product of the space race. I was born March 1962, just 174 days after Kennedy gave his We Choose to Go to the Moon speech at... I've turned the sound off because we don't really want to listen to that. Um, at Rice Stadium. As a seven-year-old, I watched Neil Armstrong walk on the moon live. And as a 30-year-old, I wrote this report at NASA Langley. Now, it may seem very gauche to give the number of citations for this paper, but the reason for doing that is it's commenting on my advisor's paper that has 4,100 citations. You go there every week and there's another 100. Now, as a graduate student in 1989, working in the corner of an aircraft hangar, I stumbled across a number of pathologies of his numerical scheme that were not in the literature, that could not be explained by numerical analysis, and that nobody else had reported. So halfway through my thesis, my advisor went off to the University of Michigan, leaving me behind. When I finished, he kindly wrote a letter of introduction uh, for me to an institute called ICASE, which was a small institute run by the University Space Research Association at NASA Langley, and I ended up there as a postdoc. So the first paper I wrote as a postdoc was this paper. It was two years in the review process, I never once saw a review. Uh, there was a disagreement between the reviewers. It ended up being uh, published with no modifications whatsoever. And I never once saw a review. So clearly the review process is not transparent. Now the reason why it was quite difficult is on the right you have an interactive applet which is a shock tube. So imagine a tube with a diaphragm and two gas states left and right diaphragm bursts, and then it gives rise to a wave pattern. You have an uncountable infinity of left and right states. If you look in the literature, you'll see the usual half a dozen tests that people run. But by the time that this, which is a building block of a numerical scheme, is put inside a, a big hydro code, it is being exercised in all sorts of different ways. So some researchers stumble across a failing, others don't. Um, so I said this was a chrono zoom. Let's zoom out a little bit. Oops. This is buried in the margin of a report that the Royal Society put out in 2008 regarding the shortfall of science, technology, engineering, mathematics teachers in the UK. So we were looking down here. And I've just replaced some of their text and made the observation that the future is really going to be dynamic documents or e-books. Tony this morning gave a few examples. So if you happen to be in a school that doesn't have a good teacher, good science teacher, what could the nation be providing you in terms of electronic textbooks that would spark your intellectual um, first. So here it's saying what makes good science or mathematics teachers. You can rephrase that and, and say what makes a good electronic document. Let's zoom out a little bit more. This will be a little bit slow for reasons that you will see in a second. This is buried inside the margin of Andrew Wiles' proof of Fermat's last theorem. So how much, can you, how much information can you squeeze into, into, into a margin? And as you'll see in a minute, how much can you squeeze into a microdot? So what I would like to draw your attention to is I don't have the mathematical background to check this proof. And I'm sure there are not many people in this room who do. But the important thing I want to bring to your attention is the 10-year-old Andrew Wiles. He read Eric Temple Bell's the last theorem and was so impressed by it that he decided he would be the first person to prove the theorem. So as many of you will know, Eric Temple Bell was a, a mathematician, originally Scottish. He's a mathematician at uh, Caltech who also wrote science fiction. So my challenge for the people in this audience is that the next paper you write 
What Easter egg could you put in that paper that would appeal to a 10-year-old, a bright 10-year-old, that would want them to embark on a career in your niche field? If you can't do that, then how long is your niche field going to last? Yes, you may have the data saved. Yes, you may have the code saved. But if the next generation is not enthused to work in your area, will the field be long-lasting? Let's zoom out a little bit more. So this paper is buried inside a Mandelbrot set. 1993, I was invited to give a talk at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute by a, a colleague. And two days before I was due to give the seminar, he called me up to say, I'm terribly sorry, James, we've double booked. You're going to have to talk opposite Mandelbrot. So there I am as a relatively new postdoc, having to give a talk in the same department, head to head with Mandelbrot. Fortunately, the room was not empty, but it could have been fuller. Mm -hmm. So at the bottom of the page, there's a very famous little ditty from Lewis Fry Richardson. Big worlds have little worlds that feed on their velocity, and little worlds have lesser worlds, and so on to viscosity. So the lesser worlds, in my mind, are the next generation coming through, who in time will grow up to be a big world. So this is buried quite carefully inside It is recomputing that Mandelbrot set. And this is a PDF document, the de facto standard for disseminating scientific documents. Now, you would not find that because it is very well hidden. Uh, using this fractal compression, I could put every paper ev uh, published, ever published, hidden in here. <laughs> right. OK, it's a, it's a cheesy little example, but what I want to show is, is that the concept of a document is changing. <coughs> right, so this is my Zoom technology. So in terms of stumbling across a numerical pathology, it's like this, it's very hit and miss. If you don't know what you're looking for and you haven't been trained to know how to ask the right questions, the fact that you have the code and the initial conditions isn't going to help you. Okay, so we're beginning to get there. So we were, we were fairly well hidden in there. So everybody in this room has specialist knowledge. And there may be overlap between individuals, but by and large there's gaps between individuals. So I'm viewing reproducible research as an opportunity to transfer knowledge between interested parties. So let's go to the talk. So that Mandelbrot set was actually buried in the ion quirk. And you can see the Cheshire cat there with a big grin on its face. So I was born in Cheshire. Um, most of you may know the meaning of quirk as being odd. Well, if you consult the Oxford English Dictionary, it has about 10 different meanings. So one of the meanings is a flourish in handwriting, or in this case, typesetting. One of the more interesting uh, meanings of the word is that in the early days of aviation, a quirk was a trainee pilot. And a quirk was also applied to an aircraft of unusual design, typically a slow-moving airplane that was used for training purposes. So what am I going to do now is I'm going to unleash my little automated mouse. As I said at the beginning, one of the difficulties of... Oops. Uh, let me start again. One of the difficulties of um, producing an executable paper is how do you demonstrate it. So here we have a few flight checks. This is, this is a PDF document stretched to the absolute limit. I'm not putting this forward as what you should use tomorrow. It's pure, purely to demonstrate a few things. So it's now possible to um, 
put in text-to-speech avatars. So Tiffany said yesterday, wouldn't it be nice to put the personal touch in a paper? It's a little bit slow. I'm here. I used to have a full head of hair, as my late mother used to say, grass doesn't grow on a busy street. Um, could you start annotating a technical paper to an audience that it wasn't primarily intended for? I've also got a, a code browser in here. So I would never claim to be a scientist. I basically write software. So on the right is a splash page of a source browser that's built into this PDF. So I have a piece of software called Amrita. Uh, it is a cooperative, cooperative programming system that allows me to nest different activities. And it's really a computational philosophy. It's not a piece of software that's meant to be used by the casual user because it can get quite intricate. Um, I'm developing it to be able to show or demonstrate proof of concepts. I also use it for my export controlled scientific computing. With a modern PDF, you can have as many interactive features as you have in an HTML page. I'm not wedded to PDF, I'm merely using it because it's the current de facto standard for disseminating scientific work in some fields. Here we have a little, uh, the YouTube video was James Burke discussing the demise of the Apollo program. Um, there are two key phrases, the taxpayer lost interest, more novelty, less understanding. So obviously with a mouse like this, it falls under the category of more novelty, less understanding. This is a street view image of the NASA Langley Lunar Landing Research Facility where I used to live, well within spitting distance, that Neil Armstrong used to practice his moon landings. So how are we going to practice producing executable papers instead of just deciding we're going to build them from the outset? There has to be some staged process. Well, the moon landings were done in Utah or something like that. No, they were done on that. Okay. So, oh yeah, yeah. So uh, what you're actually looking at here is the PDF of the program. Now, it only came out a few days ago, so I haven't really had a lot of time to do much with it. So the question is, given a year, what could I do to this program? What electronic marks, audiovisual, could I add to this program that would make you sit up and take notice? Maybe the answer is I couldn't. Here we have a pop-up note basically saying this PDF document was prepared for this meeting. Uh, it's a layered note. In a second, the mouse will move to the second of the three editor's notes, and you will see a simulation I first performed in 1989. It is embedded in this PDF, and it can be run from this PDF um, with no external links. Yes, it requires some specialist software on top, but what you're seeing here up to now has been vanilla flavor Adobe Reader on OS X. So on the left is a simulation of a weak shockwave coming out of a tube. It was first presented in public October the 6th, 1989 in Oxford. The source is buried inside the PDF. It can be accessed by the source browser I showed earlier. Um, and in the second, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at it. It can be run. Yes, this particular imp implementation is, is wedded to Unix. Me as an individual, I'm not producing a piece of software to change the universe. I'm just producing prototypes to demonstrate what could be done. So this is how I program that, that simulation. Uh, at the top, there's some, it's a tree-based programming language. There are some user instructions. There are some procedures. It plugs in a mesh refinement engine, it selects the Euler equations, two-dimensional with, with axisymmetry, invokes a procedure to set up the tube problem and then in integrates the flow. So this browser has some tabs uh, and the mouse is going to flip through the tabs and then show you some of the pertinent features. One of the advantages of using a tree-based system is you can start adding instrumentation. So the user instructions, which I've just expanded here, are just some very lightweight directives for a script robot that will allow it to run that simulation 
The simulation was run in line as I prepared the parent PDF. You'll see later that the annotations I'm applying to this document are programmed. In effect, what you're seeing is a LaTeX document. But I don't program LaTeX by typing into a file. I write a program to write the LaTeX. Having that layer in there allows me to do things in a way that would be horribly complicated to do in raw, in raw LaTeX. This is the procedure that defines the tube problem. In this programming language, all procedures can be folded down to this canon canonical form, parameters and then the body. On the left, you get some idea of the structure. Opening up the parameters, uh, it uses named parameters with default values. Uh, you don't have to give them all. Now, because it's a tree-based language and it's this system that can nest things, I'm showing you a language that you probably have zero interest in, but if I wanted to, I could put a full Python in there, or a full Fortran, or a full C++, if I needed to do some specialist work. The next tab will look at the procedure that uh, I wrote to render the image, the Schlieren image. A Schlieren image basically measures, experimentally measures the uh, gradient and density field normal to a knife edge. There's a knife edge and then there's some light source, Schlieren being German for, for, for light. Um, this is the prescription of the problem and it follows a series of interlocks. So if you were running an experimental shock tube, there's a high pressure vessel and there tends to be uh, interlocks to stop you from making a mistake by releasing one valve before something else has, has, has been closed such that you don't damage the equipment. Um, here we're looking at the refinement criteria. It's just very simple symbolic expressions which are fed into this, this computational engine, I have a lot of naive users. I don't want them writing in a general purpose programming language than coming to me and saying, look, James, it doesn't work. Because then I have to follow through a very long, tortuous uh, piece of code. I want them coming along with a nice domain-specific language that binds us together intellectually, and I can just lean over their shoulder and say the mistake is here. So I'm providing them with a, a framework to do thought experiments in their chosen field. The clear image takes three parameters and exposure that's, that's uh, restricted to be in the range 0 to 1, an amplification that is restricted to being greater than zero. The question mark says there's no upper bound. And then the grid, uh, this, this particular algorithm uses a collection of rectangular patches. Sometimes you only want to plot a subset of, set of the grid. And then the, these are the little template expressions that define the image. So we look at d rho dx, d rho dy, rho being density, define a Schlieren, compute a min max, and then a weighting function, and then a shading, and then, and then we plot it. So this is a very prescriptive programming language for a niche field, a field that Randy and maybe Soren at the back have an interest in not many else. But it's a generic programming framework. There is a separation between the scheduling of the work and the execution of the work. Uh, it uses dynamic shared objects to load in things like solvers. In this particular case, the solver is generated in the subfold run BCG. BCG is a library routine called Basic Code Generator. And it's a bit like typesetting a document. You have a document and you may want to use this font or you may want to use that font. So the idea is you should be able to request a specialist component uh, by using some phrase. So in this particular case, we're going to generate a, a component called row underscore FL 
Rho being my advisor, Phil Rowe, and the little phrase we pass in is it's a flux-limited operator split scheme. Now, of course, there are many different types of flux-limited operator split schemes, but the default one is to spit out a row code. And when that routine is run, you will end up with, with uh, a small piece of Fortran, a small harness to compile it, and a document that, that explains the innards of the solve. So this was first presented October the 6th, 1989. Uh, the reasons why I know that are unimportant here. I would like to draw your attention to the second date, July the 13th, 1990. That was the first conference I attended as a graduate student. And Randy, you were there. Do you remember what happened? Probably not. No. I had a poster, and my poster was stolen. So that was my introduction to, to intellectual uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes. So, you know, make no mistake, it will happen once you go down a reproducible research route. There will be some unscrupulous characters. It's still in my closet, though. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to change pace a little bit here. There are a couple of important dates next year. One of them is June the 23rd, which is the 100th anniversary of Turing's so how do we commemorate famous people? Well, we produce stamps. So this is a stamp that comes from St. Helena. Uh, it's a large part of their economy. Why not produce papers that could be consumed by the public? How would you annotate them? How would you bring out details that a non-expert wouldn't know? St. Helena, we know, is when Napoleon died. He died there in 1821. 1821 was the year that Michael Faraday discovered electromagnetic rotation. Think about that for a second. Electricity generation that powers your computer. Michael Faraday was an apprentice bookbinder. He read every book that he bound, and that's why he had a very good knowledge. What can you use an electronic book for in terms of growing a new generation of polymath. People are not constrained by traditional fields. Okay, so a contemporary of Turing was Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein was the son of one of the richest men in, in Europe, an Austrian steel magnate. His first love was aerodynamics. He arrived in Britain as an 18, 19 year old with a degree in mechanical slash aeronautical engineering. And he ended up, in most people's minds, as a philosopher. So this is his duck rabbit. The modern equivalent of a duck rabbit is you're looking at a document and you're looking at a program. You're looking at a program, you're looking at a document. How can you take advantage of that? Well, you can do it in a number of ways. So what is the duck rabbit looking at? People in Britain probably remember the masquerade treasure hunt in the 80s. So in my mind, that's a rabbit, and not a duck. So what does, what, what does the rabbit see? And it will zoom out in a second. What was the masquerade thing? Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a book that had a treasure hunter attached to it. So here is a wonderful little, oh, it's in the wrong place, Wonderful uh, little uh, BBC dramatization on Turing with Derek Jacobi in the lead part. And the key phrase in, in this, uh, you can, I have it on a memory stick so you can play it later, is that he says, nobody ever gets to hear about the great mathematicians. So how can you educate the public into knowing about scientists and why they need to fund scientists? Wittgenstein, this is, this is a, another, this is a Derek Jarman film on, on Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein was a very forceful character. He got so bad that he had to be banned from the Cambridge philosophical debates because he wanted to hog the room. If he had been here, we would have had some very lively debates. So this is a very pleasant pineapple. And the connection with St. Helena is that the Portuguese in 1507 planted pineapple groves. But the real connection is, is that he was very interested in language and understanding of language. This is a video of John von Neumann 
being interviewed by a 10, 11, 12-year-old Bill Clinton. So it's in the 50s, and it talks about the need to have teachers to train high school children to use the new machines, the new machines being computers. We have the Royal Society putting out reports saying we don't have enough teachers, or certainly not in Britain. So things haven't really moved forward very much. Here we have a little film the Royal Society put out to congratulate Kate and Will on their wedding. And I spoke to Tony beforehand, congratulated him on his CBE. My cousin Carol uh, was a policewoman in royal protection, and she used to look after Prince William and Prince Harry and Diana, and latterly was the Queen's personal bodyguard. Prince William is a member of the Royal Society. So the, the concept of patronage the role the Royal Society has to play in propagating science should not be underestimated. So here's a little aphorism that comes from my near namesake. You see what your knowledge tells you you're seeing. So here we have a little annoying mouse, but that mouse is making use of three virtual machines, not virtual environments. We, there has been some confusion at this workshop, the difference between a virtual machine and a virtual environment. Once you go down the executable paper route, you can demonstrate, demonstrate precisely what you mean by a particular term. This is the source of this PDF document. Once you start delving down into the tree, it's not something I would necessarily be proud of, but at least I can show it in a document, in a generic piece of software, that everybody will have installed, or almost everybody will have installed. And it will now attempt to flick through the... So it's a LaTeX document. I write a program to write a LaTeX document. And again, it's folded in the same way that the Schlieren image and the tube problem were folded. You now see a giant question mark. Running up the side of that question mark is the end of Kennedy's We Choose to Go to the Moon speech. Um, so I'm essentially adding electronic marks to a pre existing PDF. So the markup there is not in the generalized sense, it's markup as in putting ink marks on an on a, on a electronic document. Unfortunately, I have a pause for the mouse, but I don't have a fast forward, so we're pretty much stuck with what I've programmed into it. But all I'm trying to do here is, I'm not saying here's a piece of software, please use it. I'm merely saying here's, here's a piece of software. How many people in this room would have thought this was possible with PDF? If you're honest. Okay, that, that's the sole point that I want to get across. There are, there are many things in a generic piece of software that you all use, and the understanding of that software is not what it should be if we want to move forward. Back to our little splash page. Uh, the mouse will now activate the Easter egg, which is an annotated version of this program. Cast your mind back to the Cheshire Cat. Anybody in this room not know what the Cheshire Cat is? It, okay, it's a, it's a children's classic that binds us all together. Everybody in the room knows what it is. What would be the equivalent computational classic? So when all the participants in a workshop come along and there's all some common denominator that you can all refer to. And that's tied into the idea of putting an Easter egg in a, in, a, in a formal scientific paper to try and attract fresh blood into, into a field. So, you know, there are endless arguments on the web where people argue the merits of Perl, Python, Ruby. For me, the character's in a file. I'll write one program that, that wraps them all together. I don't care. 
Okay, so Amrita, which is the system I have, is really a computational philosophy, but it allows me to produce an end-to-end -end investigation that is wrapped inside val validation and verification. In my technical field, the two Vs have very precise meanings. Typically, you have to do both, so it doesn't matter if you get them mixed up, but there are endless debates about what the words mean. But what I want to concentrate on here is the concept of computational classic. Okay, so computational classics, like their literary counterparts, are entities society recognizes as passing on from generation to generation in an ideal world. Do we have anything that we want to pass on from generation to generation? A sort of little misshapen R script or a Perl script or a Python script is not really something that is going to excite a child in the way that Andrew Wiles was excited. Computational classics exist to inspire thirsty young minds to seek out careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Computational classics are multidimensional electronic documents that can be enjoyed at different levels of sophistication. So these tweets are really a wish list. This is my best stab at demonstrating that I'm not a lunatic. But it would take a serious commitment on the part of society if it wanted to move in this general direction. Computational classics walk their readers through challenging material, and I stress the word challenging, using interactive work examples. Computational classics go beyond point-and-click interactions to introduce their readers to the joys of reason scientific thinking. We've heard too much for my liking in this workshop about how easy something is. Well, if you make it too easy, the brain switches off, and then the absorption and understanding may be missing. And the last one it talks about evolution. Oops. We have a small technical hitch. The source browser, for some reason, has not turned itself off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the mouse. I'm going to manually close that. And then I'm going to resume. That's fine. Um, this is just running through, through uh, a bit of a fact. If, if we don't want that, what I can do is, because we're, we're running the time, I will go into manual mode. I will recover the document. And I will show one little example on this page. Oops. Where is my mouse gone? So I've annotated the, the workshop program. I'm coming at it from the perspective of somebody in computational fluid dynamics. I'm also coming at it from the perspective of somebody who grew up in a town called Birkenhead. Birkenhead was a shipbuilding town uh, in 1858. HMS Birkenhead sank off the, the, the South Africa, and the heroic act of the people who let women and children go first, rather than swamp the, the lifeboats, led to the likes of a lake in British Columbia being named Lake Birkenhead. Have you been there? So it, so it cuts to the heart of what selfish or selfless act is the reproducible research community going to do today such that there's some benefit at a later date? April the 15th, 2012, is the 100th anniversary of the Titanic sinking. The sister ship of the Titanic is the Olympic. Uh, in Britain next year are the Olympics, which will tend to overshadow. So this is my Birkenhead drill going down. And I've squeezed in a video, YouTube video, on HMS Birkenhead into the dot of an eye. But as you saw earlier, I can squeeze much more information in it than that. What I want to do is get to the bottom of this page, because there's a very nice little example. Um, this conference is, is partly sponsored by an organization that has a logo that looks like a pie. Specific Institute of Mathematical 
So just as another little typesetting trick at the bottom of this page, I have put a little example that computes pi using a uh, recurring fraction. So in my field, we, we're, we're preoccupied by verification and validation. And the verification is often looking at model problems. So one model problem is how to use a document to control a third-party piece of software. So my little, little model problem here is to compute pi using a interactive Ruby shell and a recurring fraction. So here we have the Ruby program. There we have the mathematical formula. Now, when I was learning to program in 1980, you used to have to enter programs in line by line. There was no internet. You may have a cassette interface, but the cassette interface wasn't very reliable. So if you were smart, you would study the program before you started entering it to make sure that there were no typographical mistakes. So with the, the automated wonders of the little mouse, I can, I can run down. And if you check your clock, this is on Eastern time. So it should be roughly right. And then it's entering the commands line by line. OK, this is a gimmick. It could be R. It doesn't have to be entered line by line. You could be feeding files. You can be having the, the, uh, a data renderer. I just want to get across the fact that a document and a program are merging. And it's in this particular case, it's not. Uh, you could, but there is a local host server buried inside the PDA. And that's what allows that to work. And then, it, and then it will quit that. So all I'm trying to do is just to point out that there are opportunities that are going begging because the general understanding of what an electronic document is is not as broad as it could be. Flagship, that's, that was my connection with the Titanic. Um, here you have a little simulation of a lax wendroff scheme propagating a step function, and it shows the post-shock uh, oscillations or lagging phase error. So in my mind, a, su a successful scientific event requires critical debate, and I haven't heard any discussion so far as to what the hidden dangers of reproducible research are. In 1984, I was screamed at for two and a half hours by my line manager in a manufacturer of steam turbines because I had performed a simulation where I had lifted the value of surface roughness from a journal paper without fully understanding what surface roughness was. And that is the day or one danger when you go down a reproducible research route. It, it's automated. I don't need to be here. I could, I could go elsewhere. So it's, it's, it's on a memory stick. If anybody wants it, then. With that, since you're running a little bit into lunch, perhaps you can questions.